From anatomy to anesthesiology, from pathology to pharmacology, from microbiology to medicine, a one-man resource to the world of health sciences. Welcome to Dr. Paul's Medical Lectures. A practicing physician, Dr. Paul offers you essential insights on diseases afflicting millions of people around the world. For today's lecture, here is Dr. Paul. Good evening, folks. This is Dr. Paul. Thank you very much for tuning to our channel today. Today I want to talk a few minutes about uh, hypothyroidism. You see, when you see the symptoms and signs in these uh, patients like cold intolerance and dyspnea, weight gain, dry, dry skin, and constipation, edema, periorbital edema, and uh, hoarseness, weakness, menorrhagia, keratinemia, I discussed in my first video how almost every system in the body will be affected by hypothyroidism. And we can also see other problems like celiac disease. You see, celiac disease is present in hazmatous thyroiditis, like 5% of patients with hazmatous thyroiditis can have celiac disease, resulting in weight loss, gastrointestinal symptoms, and uh, other symptoms, like, I mean, there is hazmatous thyroiditis and also celiac disease, and causing all sorts of problems. So these patients can have hypothyroidism plus celiac problems. I mean, all the symptoms and signs they might have due to hypothyroidism and then due to celiac disease like anemia, osteomalacia, delayed puberty, amenorrhea, reduced infertility, those kinds of stuff. And they can also have intestinal malabsorption causing vitamin deficiency. And uh, it, could, it, it could be based on different vitamin deficiencies. Vitamin K can cause clotting abnormalities, hypercalcinemia with uh, vitamin A deficiency, or bone, form, bone problems due to vitamin D deficiency, or ataxia due to vitamin B12 deficiency. The point is, uh, celiac disease plus hypothyroidism can cause a constellation of symptoms and signs. Now, I will take care of it. Now I want to talk a few minutes about um, the laboratory diagnosis. You see, you should uh, uh, suspect uh, hypothyroidism in any patient who is having signs and symptoms of hypothyroidism. And the single best screening test for hypothyroidism is serum TSH. And I never forget that. The single best screening test for hypothyroidism is the serum TSH. Serum TSH is increased in primary hypothyroidism, all right, when the gland is failing to produce thyroid hormone, the stimulation comes from pituitary, so the TSH levels gets increased. So TSH levels going high in primary hypothyroidism. And uh, that's an important thing to remember. But when there is pituitary insufficiency, TSH becomes low, that results in hypothyroidism. In other words, in secondary hypothyroidism, the TSH is low. Okay? So in primary hypothyroidism, TSH is high. Secondary hypothyroidism, TSH is low. And there could be other problems in... Uh, in the, in the labs, as I have said, hypothyroidism affects almost every organ in the body, so there can be hypoglycemia, hyponatremia, lipid abnormalities, anemia, and uh, increased liver enzymes, and uh, hypothyroidism can uh, cause infertility. In that case, it can have, uh, if you do a semen, semen analysis, you will see an increase in abnormal sperm morphology. So the labs in hypothyroidism depend on which systems were affected. And you can also see antiperoxidase antibodies or uh, thyroglobulin antibodies whenever there is that uh, autoimmune problem causing this problem. Okay, folks. So laboratory diagnosis, you need to remember those points. TSH is the best single marker, the screening test, and then other tests depend upon uh, what is patient is having in this problem. Dr. Paul, 
Yeah. I just need to get your signature on the back of these and just be a few physicals. Thank you. Now a few words about the subclinical hypothyroidism. Subclinical hypothyroidism it's basically a high TSH but normal thyroid hormone. Okay, a high TSH but normal thyroid hormone. That is subclinical hypothyroidism. And about 18% of patients with uh, subclinical hypothyroidism they become uh, clinically hypothyroid. So, so it's a, it, it, when you see subclinical hypothyroidism, you should treat them because they will effectively become uh, hypothyroid with time. Now, is there any place for imaging studies? Yes. When you see a goiter and uh, you need to see what is there, and many times you order a CT of the neck and you see a retrosternal, a retrosternal goiter and that has to be evaluated. Sometimes an enlarged thymus in the medias thynum is seen, especially in patients with autoimmune thyroiditis. In primary hypothyroidism with uh, elevated TSH levels, if you take an MRI of the head, you see the pituitary enlargement. Why? You see, pituitary is sending more TSH to stimulate the thyroid gland which is failing to produce thyroid hormone. So as a result, the pituitary gland gets hypertrophy. That's not a pituitary tumor. The other thing is, uh, the next concept is euthyroid 6 syndrome. Euthyroid 6 syndrome. Basically, this is a condition where you see abnormal thyroid labs in presence of severe sickness. I mean, it could be a severe non-thyroid illness or uh, after surgery, after radiation. And uh, these patients will have abnormal labs even though they don't have thyroid disease. So this is euthyroid 6 syndrome. So, when you see this, I mean, you need to evaluate what is happening to this patient. Is there anything more that needs to be done? And many times these patients develop other problems. I mean, hypothyroidism can come from pituitary insufficiency. That's one thing. And uh, if if pituitary insufficiency means low TSH, hypothyroidism means low thyroid hormone. So that actually complicates the picture. When both TSH and thyroid hormone are low, you're confused. What is going on here? But when you suspect pituitary insufficiency, especially in patients with diabetes insipidus or some central nervous system problems, you need to give a trial of uh, thyroid hormone. Give thyroid hormone and see how these patients respond. Yeah. Also patients, um, yeah. uh, at this point I want to talk about complications. Complications of uh, hypothyroidism are mostly cardiac. They affect heart. And uh, mostly they occur as a result of coronary artery disease and congestive heart failure. That's why you should carefully treat these patients. If you give too much thyroid, they're going to complete heart failure. So you need to give, treat them very, very carefully. And also hypothyroid patients will have increased susceptibility to bacterial pneumonia and uh, gastrointestinal system becomes slow and uh, long-standing constipation. They develop a megacolon. Yeah. And there is another condition called myxedema madness when patients get uh, those paranoid delusions as a result of hypothyroidism. But also hypothyroidism can cause infertility because thyroid uh, is important. And when you see pregnant women with uh, hypothyroidism, if it is severe, they can develop actually miscarriage. 
the other thing is uh, maximum uh, coma many times in severe hypothyroidism patients can develop cognitive uh, difficulties confusion swamblings and that can end up in coma we call it maximum coma patients can develop a convulsions and abnormal central nervous system problems they can also develop uh, hypoglycemia hyperventilation hyponatremia and uh, so hypotension rhabdomyolysis so you see folks almost every organ system is affected when the patient develop this uh, uh, myxedema and uh, most common myxedema coma happens in elderly women and uh, who have stopped taking their th thyroxine medication or who have had uh, a stroke so that's that shows the importance of uh, stressing uh, uh, taking uh, thyroid hormone indefinitely when patients have uh, hypothyroidism now i want to talk about uh, myxedema coma in particular in myxedema coma the mortality rate is very very high the other thing is myxedema patients are unusually sensitive to opioids so i'm take and even giving them an average dose of opioid can kill them so remember that myxedema aspect myxedema patients are unusually sensitive to opioids and uh, can result in a in death even average doses of uh, opioids now treatment treatment of hypothyroidism depends on the age and uh, sex and clinical status if it is mild hypothyroidism you start with like a 25 micrograms daily and if it is uh, severe then you start at a high dose so you say very mild start with low dose very significant symptomatic hypothyroidism start with high dose in pregnant women with hypothyroidism you need to start very high dose like 100 to 150 micrograms orally daily because the developing fetus needs lots and lots of thyroxine so you see folks it basically depends on the age and the clinical status and you measure serum tsh slowly and uh, you give advice to the patients how to take it because uh, food interferes with the uh, thyroid administrative absorption so you need to tell them that they should take it with an empty stomach so always keep those things in mind folks and you need to monitor tsh like every 2 to 4 weeks and uh, adjust the level of thyroxine thyroid accordingly and if the patient is in a myxedema or severe very severe hypothyroidism then you need to give levothyroxine intravenously because these patients need immediate action the other thing is if you give them by mouth that myxedema itself inhibits absorption of synthroid so in these patients you start with uh, intravenous thyroid administration i mean patients with very severe hypothyroidism now thyroxine dose requirements may need to be titrated upward when patient is also taking medications that uh, increase hepatic metabolism okay and uh, many medications we have today like carbamazepine or phenobarbital primadon or uh, even uh, phenytoin rifampicin rifampicin these medications they increase hepatic metabolism of synthroid so in these patients you need to give a high dose of synthroid the other medication is uh, amiodarone you see amiodarone can cause both uh, hypothyroidism or hypothyroidism so in the in patients who are taking the amiodarone you should closely monitor their tsh and to titrate their synthroid uh, accordingly and many times patients will develop a uh, malabsorption um, and uh, in those cases you need to see what is causing decreased absorption of synthroid and as i said even multivitamins fiber and antacids 
and uh, even uh, proton pump inhibitors are listed, calcium supplements, magnesium supplements. These can interfere with the absorption of centroid. And some patients even take bile acid binding uh, uh, compounds like cholestermine. Cholestermine can also inhibit the absorption of centroid. So in these patients, you need to ask them, are you taking with food or an empty stomach? If you are taking on uh, with food, definitely there is uh, inhibition of the absorption of uh, synthroid and patients should uh, change that. And uh, during pregnancy, it is very, very critical to administer adequate doses of synthroid because the fetus develops on uh, synthroid, on thyroxine for the development. Room one. Room one, okay, thank you. So, folks, those are the most important points. Always monitor serum TSH, and accordingly, you need to go with the administration of uh, centroid. Because, uh, as I said, there are so many things that can affect the centroid uh, uh, absorption into the body. You need to keep those things also in the mind when you are treating these uh, patients. So those are the most important uh, points I wanted to share with you this uh, afternoon. And if you know any other points, feel free to uh, add them in our comment section. All you folks, thank you very much. Have a nice day. Thanks for listening. For more medical videos, please visit us at www.drpaul.org and take time to browse through hundreds of health videos we regularly post on our site. If you are preparing for USMLE, PLAB, and other medical exams, make sure you visit our website to browse through our videos explaining the essential points you need to know before taking these examinations. For more information, visit us at www.drpaul.org. Thank you, and may God richly bless you.